Perfect. Okay, so, uh, so I'm going to minimize. Oh, sorry, you're about to say. You have it all good? Yeah, I'm yeah. good. So, yeah, ju just as introduction, uh, hello everyone. Uh, we are in another learning share session. Uh, today we're going to, we have basically Wilson with us, Wilson Buyen, who's the author of one of the authors of Revisiting the Nova Proof System or the Nova Hack uh, paper. <laughs> at least how some of us would call it. Uh, he's going to basically go through all of the review uh, of the Nova Proof system and the instantiation of the cycle of curves on it, uh, give a detailed explanation over the entire protocol and paper and the revision that they did, and also kind of the IBC compiler or the structure that they have uh, come up with. Uh, after that, as usual, we're going to have a Q&A session where anyone is free to ask any questions about the paper or the presentation. So I hand it to you, Wilson. Thank you very much for being with us and feel free to start. Thank you uh, for having me. Uh, so today I'll be presenting our work, revisiting the Nova Proof System on a cycle of curves. This is joint work with Stan Bonet and Srinath Seti from Stanford and Microsoft Research. Oops, there. Cool. So incrementally verifiable computation or IVC introduced by Valiant in 2008, is a method to prove the outcome of some continuous iterative computation. So you can imagine you have some a base element Z0 and some function f, and you want to prove the claim that Zi is the result of applying this function f i times on that original value. So when would this uh, actually be useful? Well, some modern day examples are you want to prove the outcome of some verifiable delay function. And so in this case, f is just some slow to compute function and computing at i times should take a certain amount of time. Um, also, ZK EVMs. So ZK EVMs, you can think about as state machines. So now the Zs end up being states uh, and f is some state transition function. So you want to prove that after i steps of some state transition, um, you actually end up with that final state. So our work, how does this fit in the context of everything? We describe a soundness vulnerability in the original implementation of the Nova IVC scheme. Uh, we implement the attack generically for any choice of functions, uh, but to particular to demonstrate the vulnerability, we generated a fake but accepting proof of two of the 75 iterations of the minroot VDF in only 116 milliseconds. <clears throat> so, if this IVC scheme had actually been secure, this would have taken thousands of years. So there was a, a natural vulnerability. And in this work, we also patch the vulnerability and prove uh, the patch is actually secure. So we provide a secure compiler from folding schemes to IVC over a cycle of curves. So what should you take away from this talk? We're going to give a brief intuition on folding schemes. They're not the main focus of this work. Uh, we're going to construct uh, IVC over cycle of curves from these folding schemes. And then we're just going to go over uh, the original uh, vulnerability in Nova. So a brief detour to folding schemes. Uh, but in order to discuss folding schemes, we'll have to know the structure of the elements. And so I'm going to do a brief review of RNCS. Hopefully this is a review. So RNCS is a constraint system, which consists of three matrices, uh, A, B, and C, and an instance witness pair X, W, which are just vectors over a field, uh, satisfy this constraint system if they satisfy the equation on the right. So the matrix vector product of AZ, uh, Hadamard product BZ equals CZ. So this is just a Hadamard product, just a component-wise product. And so Nova introduces the notion of relaxed RNCS. So this is a, uh, as it, in the name, a relaxed version of RNCS. So instead of an instance witness pair XW, we now have uh, UW, which also contain commitments and openings to commitments. So U here contains two extra commitments over some group, which is a witness commitment, and now an additional error commitment. And so they satisfy a relaxed notion of RNCS, where you additionally shift by an error vector, and you also scale this matrix product by a scalar S. And so hopefully this is a, hopefully this can be seen as a direct generalization of RNCS, just a more relaxed notion. 
But because it's a direct generalization of RNCS, uh, we can actually test whether a particular instance, uh, U, uh, satisfies RNCS without any error. In particular, we just check if this error commitment is a zero and if the scalar is just uh, one. Uh, furthermore, since we have this option to scale and also add an error vector, it actually is trivial to come up with um, arbitrary pairs that satisfy a relaxed RNCS. So think about these as just um, for any uh, constraint system, we can just generate these pairs and it'll just satisfy that constraint system. So what are our folding schemes then? The, the main motivation is to be able to reduce uh, the claim that a pair of instance witnesses satisfy RNCS to a claim that a single pair satisfies some constraint system. So a folding scheme consists of a pair of algorithms this time, a folding verifier, which takes in two instances and reduces it to a single instance and also a folding prover, which takes in addition the witnesses and reduces the pairs to a single pair. Now I've omitted some other items uh, in the true folding scheme, but I think the main gist is that you reduce the pairs down to uh, a single pair. I think, I think someone's mic might be on. Um, okay. So why do we care about a uh, cycle of curves? Well, in order to construct IVC, we'll actually have to specify the, the folding verifier in a constraint system itself. And so the folding verifier consists of a random linear combination over a field, but also a random linear combination of the group elements uh, in the instance itself. And so this will require a uh, group operation. And so expressing um, field operations and field constraints is, is pretty simple, but how do you actually represent uh, group operations as field constraints? So this will require us to actually take a non-black box look into the commitment scheme. So zooming into those operations, uh, the group is actually an elliptic curve group whose base field is a different field from the scalar field. So this field is of order P and this group is of order P, but now this field is of order Q. And so what is a base field? Well, each group element can be represented as a pair of field elements that satisfy this elliptic curve equation here. And so the concrete representation of the group element is over a different field than the actual scalar field of that group. And so expressing group operations over their scalar field will actually end up uh, reducing down to the problem of how do you represent uh, foreign field operations as, um, as uh, scalar field constraints. And so the way to think about this is that you just perform a lot of non-native arithmetic. So it's like representing a modular multiplication and addition, but over a different field. And so it turns out for each group operation, uh, this ends up being quite expensive. But we just said that this group is represented as elements of ref Q. So why not just express those group operations over the base field uh, instead? Um, and so that motivates the need for two different constraint systems, but also a cycle of curves. So I'll explain what a cycle of curves is in just a moment here. So a cycle of curves is a pair of groups. One group has its base field over FQ, but has a scalar field over FP. So here, so this group, has a field, a scalar field of order P, but its base field is a different field. Uh, so that the concrete representation of these group elements is actually over uh, as a pair of these field elements. And then another group uh, whose scalar field is the base field of the other curve. So now we represent, uh, oh yeah, so this, so this is of order Q and this is of order Q, but now its base field is the other group's scalar field. So, uh, a cycle of curves basically just reduces down to two elliptic curve groups where the scalar field of one group is actually the base field of the other group. Now, if this uh, didn't make total sense, I think the, um, uh, the implication on the next slide is what's actually necessary. But this cycle of curves is just needed for basically the efficient folding scheme to work out. 
So the core idea is that you have some constraint system over one field, and we have their relaxed instance witness pairs. To fold those pairs, we can actually represent this folding verifier efficiently over some other constraint system over a secondary field. Now, this constraint system has their own uh, relaxed instance witness pairs. And to constrain that folding algorithm, we can actually express those as constraints over the primary uh, constraint system. So now the difference is we have two constraint systems over two different fields, each of which with their own relaxed instance witness pairs. The folding of those pairs, we can represent efficiently over the opposite constraint system. So now the difference is we have uh, two types of relaxed instance witness pairs and also two different constraint systems over two different fields. So recap so far, we described IVC as a method to prove the outcome of some uh, continuous iterative computation. We discussed a rough intuition on what folding algorithms are uh, as a pair of algorithms, a folding verifier and a folding prover. And we discussed how to efficiently constrain folding verifiers over two different constraint systems. So now we actually have enough to discuss our compiler uh, from folding schemes to efficient IVC over a cycle. So what changes with the cycle now? So I, de I described a very simplistic version of IVC, but what is IVC over a cycle? So this was standard IVC. So we had one function. And we also had uh, one constraint system over one field. Now, as you can imagine, we have two functions operating over two different fields. And now we have two constraint systems operating over two different fields. And a hint is these constraint systems will be actually the constraint systems that we saw prior. So now what is the claim of IVC in this, in this new setting? The claim is that uh, we're actually gonna prove I evaluations of the pair of functions over a pair of values and a pair of claimed evaluations. So I'll have two claimed evaluations, uh, two base case values, and two functions. The IVC verifier will take in this claim, but also some IVC proof and accept uh, or reject. Now we'll actually have enough to give a brief intuition on on how the IVC prover actually performs their steps. So if we look at this diagram here, the most natural interpretation of what an IVC prover does per step is they perform one step of both functions. So here I describe this, these are the different IVC steps and each input is you know the function input and the function outputs. Now, how do we actually uh, approve uh, one function execution? In each of these steps, will actually prove the satisfaction of two different constraint systems. And these constraint systems contain in them um, the actual constraints which uh, constrain the function. So this constraint system applies one step of the function f1, and this prime and the secondary constraint system uh, uh, proves one step of this secondary function. So to reiterate, what we're looking at is a diagram of the IVC prover execution. And at each step, we're attempting to prove an, uh, a set of executions, one for F1 and one for F2. In order to do so, we prove the satisfaction of two constraint systems. Now, Diving uh, into the IVC construction a little further, proving satisfaction of a constraint system doesn't end up proving all I steps. It only proves um, a single step. So how do we actually end up um, proving that we performed all I minus one steps appropriately? Well, the satisfaction of one of these constraint systems or the execution of one, of one step of the function, we can represent as an actual relaxed instance. And then after I iterations, we'll actually have um, I of these instances. 
And so if we think back on our folding intuition, we're reducing the claim that we have uh, two satisfying instances to one satisfying instance. So ultimately what we would like to do is to accumulate the satisfaction of all these constraint systems into instances which we'll label as these accumulators. So if these accumulators are satisfied, then all of these individual instances were satisfied, meaning that we actually applied I iterations of the function. So that's uh, the main goal is to produce these accumulators. So zooming into the step further, in addition to taking in the function inputs or the pair of function inputs, each step will take in an accumulator or a pair of accumulators for all prior steps. So this accumulator represents the satisfaction of all of these uh, constraint systems on the primary, and this represents the satisfaction of all the secondary constraint systems. In addition to the accumulators and the function inputs, we also take in a strict instance. So this instance here will actually represent the satisfaction of the prior secondary constraint system. So I have labeled in green uh, what is a strict but satisfying um, instance. So this constraint system, so I lied a bit earlier, it not only applies one step of the primary function, but also does a folding step. So it takes in the secondary accumulator and also the secondary strict instance and folds them to produce the new accumulator. So it does, so this constraint system does a single step of the function, but also folds the opposite instances. Now the satisfaction of this constraint system, we can represent as another instance for the primary constraint system. And similarly, we apply one step of the secondary function in the secondary constraint system, but fold the opposite instance plus the accumulator we had as input to this step. And now the satisfaction of this constraint system can also be represented as a strict instance a strict instance for the secondary constraint system. And so if we look in at the inputs and the outputs of every IVC step, they're the same. Function inputs, function outputs, a strict uh, instance for the secondary constraint system, a strict instance for the secondary constraint system. And these are the updated accumulators, and these are the accumulators for the prior. So if these accumulators were for the prior I steps, these accumulators are for the prior I steps, plus the most recent uh, constraint systems. So we just updated the accumulator, we applied one step of the function, and now we also have another uh, strict instance here. And that's basically what the IRVC prover does at every step. So it starts off with just uh, the base case values, some arbitrary uh, beginning instance, and some arbitrary accumulators. And then just applies the steps repeatedly. So now that we have the rough structure of what the IVC prover does every single step, what actually are the constraints uh, within this augmented constraint system? So here I'll describe the primary uh, constraint system, which is over the first field. Uh, but you can imagine the secondary constraint system is actually just symmetric, but you switch all the twos for ones and all the ones for twos. So in addition to taking in the function input and both instances. So this is the accumulator and this was the strict instance we saw earlier. We also take in an index, which will help us keep track of what index we're operating on. Uh, but we'll also forward uh, the original base value. So at the very, very end, we at least know what the original base value was. And now this instance here is now a little bit different. So remember how um, a relaxed instance was comprised of two commitments, but also some instance X. So in this case, our instance will be two hashes. So x0, you can think about x0 as constraining the input elements to each constraint system, and x1 as constraining the output elements of every constraint system. And so 
here, the first check will actually be on x0. So the input instance, its x0 contains all of the elements in the witness. So we can see here that this hash simply just constrains all of the input uh, elements. Furthermore, we just check if this instance we took in as input is actually strict. So it actually is the, the satisfaction of the prior constraint system without any error. <laughs> then we apply one step of the function and also we apply one folding step. And now the instance checks. So remember how I said X1 was used to constrain the outputs of each constraint system. So the outputs are one increment on the index, we forward the base value, and then we also include the function evaluation and the new folded accumulator. And so this structure here is actually the same structure as this uh, X0 hash. But now there's a special uh, copy constraint here, which is actually very essential for the, the vulnerability, but also the proof of security. So what is this copy constraint? So this copy constraint copies the output hash of this prior instance into the input hash of this other of this next instance. And so basically what this x0 x1 swapping does is it makes sure it makes sure that we're actually aligning the hash checks with the appropriate constraint system since we're swapping back from rncs1 to rncs2 to rncs1 we want to make sure that the inputs connect with the right outputs. So uh, I've I have a diagram in the next slide, but I'll pause a little bit so that we can absorb this uh, constraint system a little bit more. So we have input checks, output checks, and we apply one step of the function and the folding verifier. Okay, so why is this uh, copy constraint actually necessary? I've labeled in purple um, what is uh, needed for the first constraint system, and I've labeled in orange what is necessary for the secondary constraint system. So each instance has two hashes, x0 and x1. x0 and x1, x0 and x1, x0 and x1. Now, what is this? So First, let's discuss the hash checks. So this is just the uh, hash check on the inputs for this constraint system. And X1 is a hash check on the outputs for this constraint system. And now ideally, we would like to forward that to the next instance. So here you can see this copying constraint I've represented as an arrow. If we follow the diagram here, all this copy constraint does is it just makes sure that the output of RNCS1 will end up being connected to the input of RNCS1, but in a later step. And similarly, uh, for the secondary constraint system, this copying constraint makes sure that makes makes sure that we connect the output to the input for uh, the secondary constraint system. So because we're swapping between two different two different constraint systems, we have to swap the input and output hashes. So now we have enough to discuss uh, what IVC verification does. So the new proof uh, for IVC uh, is actually just the output of a single IVC step. So it was both accumulators, but also the last strict instance. So this instance here represents the, the satisfaction of the last constraint system. And then the accumulators represent the satisfaction of all the prior um, constraint systems. So the verification algorithm takes in the claim, as we described earlier, but this IVC proof pi. It checks if this last strict instance uh, is actually strict. It checks if all the pairs uh, satisfy their respective constraint systems. And then this is where the special part comes in. We check that the x0 part is actually um, binding the outputs that we claim plus the accumulator that should have been folded in the primary instance. And then we check that the output of the secondary constraint system ends up being the last uh, secondary evaluations, plus the accumulator that we have in the proof. 
So both these hashes bind both these accumulators, but also bind uh, the claimed evaluations. And so the reason why we're checking the X0 instance here for all the primary values uh, is because this constraint system has a copy constraint. So this actually ends up being the X1 of the primary instance. And so it turns out that uh, this is actually secure and this actually was the fix that we applied. So we prove this secure in our paper as the secure verification algorithm. Now, what went wrong in the original uh, Nova implementation? Well, the proof pi didn't consist of those three elements. Uh, the diagram for the prover is actually way different. Um, it includes an additional element um, over the primary instance. So this alone does not actually cause the vulnerability, but it's sort of the way they had the intuition on the implementation that caused the verification algorithm to be a little bit different because this uh, element is actually unnecessary. So this is the vulnerable verification algorithm. So the verification algorithm takes in this uh, modified proof in addition to all the checks. So these are the checks I've labeled in black. It checks whether this instance is strict. It checks additionally if this uh, instance of despair or uh, satisfy. But now this is the key difference, the very subtle change that caused the vulnerability. So here we checked um, the secondary instances x0, that it was the hash of the following elements, and similarly, the hash of the primary elements. But now we checked that this instance is x1, so this is the output hash for this constraint system, were these elements. Now, this seems reasonable, right? We have two constraint systems that we're repeatedly proving satisfaction of. And so you would expect that I can just provide um, the primary instance and its output should actually just be the output evaluation um, that isn't actually supposed to be there. But it turns out that if you do this, there actually ends up being no constraints on the X0 hashes. And because there's no constraints on the, uh, the X0 hashes, you can actually split this verification algorithm into two sets of independent checks. And then that will allow us to actually generate a malicious IVC proof. So now we can actually talk about uh, the attack. So what I've done here is I've just added a space. So I've represented the vulnerable uh, IVC proof and I've just segmented it into two halves. So I just put one strict instance, one accumulator, one strict instance, and one accumulator. And so it turns out that if you look closely on the, um, the vulnerable verifiers checks, they actually can be split into two independent checks that are actually symmetric. So we check if this strict instance is strict, if both pairs are satisfying, and if the X1 hashes align uh, with this uh, accumulator here. So here, Oh, I think I might have a typo here. This should be, oh, okay. So I have a minor typo here, but it's okay. We can, we can ignore that for now. Um, ooh. This should be, oh, sorry. Okay, so the typo is that this should be over here and this should be over here. Sorry, so I just checked if this instance is strict um, and both pairs are satisfying. And then that this accumulator is actually contained in the output hash of this. So in a sense, we claim that this accumulator was the result of some folding of this constraint system. So the attack overview. Um, so we can actually claim, an, uh, so we can actually claim evaluation for an arbitrary set of starting values. So it doesn't, you can just, the attacker can just choose any starting values they want. It won't matter in the end. And you can also choose any arbitrary pre-images. So these are pre-images uh, to one function execution. So the claimed evaluations that we'll prove are we'll claim I evaluations um, of some evaluations EI, which are just one function application of these. And so these can actually just be any arbitrary pre-images. So they don't have to be actual, the results of I minus one executions of the function. You can just choose arbitrary values. And so the first step, oh, sorry, the second step will be to generate uh, malicious pairs um, from for half the proof. 
And then since the checks are symmetric, it turns out we can actually uh, symmetrically generate uh, malicious pairs uh, for the sec uh, for the other side. So all we have to do in the algorithm is actually just to flip all the twos to ones and all the ones to twos. And it turns out everything works out. And it's because these checks are actually symmetric. And then finally, we just output uh, the malicious proof. So we just concatenate the malicious pairs that we uh, that we generated. And this proof will end up being accepting. So how do we actually generate uh, these malicious pairs that align with these starting values and, and these pre-images? So we'll actually end up uh, running the honest prover uh, for one IVC step, but on maliciously crafted inputs. So here we have a malicious uh, strict instance where we, it doesn't actually have to be satisfying. And so this I've labeled in red, all the non-satisfying instances. I labeled in green instances that are actually satisfiable. And so we basically just cook up um, this malicious input instance. And so uh, we don't, actually don't care about the commitments here. And we don't care about the scale here because we don't actually need this to be satisfying. So I set x0 to be the hash of basically trash values. It turns out that we won't actually end up caring about these trash values. So it doesn't even have to be satisfying this accumulator and this z value can be any arbitrary z value. Uh, but what's important is that we cooked into this x1 hash the claim that we performed i minus one iterations and that we use the base case value and also that we use the pre-image that we desire. Uh, this accumulator here will end up being, uh, we'll just use, um, so at the very beginning of the, of the presentation, I said that you can just come up with arbitrary pairs that satisfy the constraint system. And so here we literally just have an arbitrary pair uh, you bought that satisfies the primary constraint system. And so we prove first the satisfaction of the first constraint system. So remember the function inputs. So uh, here I have a strict instance. I have some claimed accumulator and also the function input from the prior step. So uh, we mod we uh, sorry we cooked up this x zero hash so that it actually passes the input hash check. So this hash check is satisfied. And then this x one hash gets forwarded to the next instance. So we just have this copy constraint here. And then this output hash check is just is just trivial. So it, it is satisfiable just because we've we made it satisfiable. So I've labeled them brown. Well, we'll end up just throwing away because we won't actually care about it. And so now we perform the, the second half step of the IVC prover. So now we take in as input the pre-image that we desire for the secondary uh, function. The um, the satisfying accumulator you bought, and then this actually ends up um, satisfying the hash check. Sorry, there is a typo here. This should be u one here, and so uh, because we satisfy the secondary constraint system, uh, this hash of arbitrary junk values will end up being forwarded to this x zero uh, element here. But uh, we don't actually have and the verifier checks don't check anything about the x zero elements, and so it, it, this x zero element could just be trash. So this hash doesn't really matter since we never even check it. Uh, and so we engineered uh, the x one hash. So when it's forwarded to the secondary instance, it actually passes all the hash checks, and now this secondary instance has a hash of all the desired elements in the verifier's check. So we've claimed that we have had i iterations. We're using this base value. We uh, wanted this z uh, value. And now, what is this accumulator here? So remember, the verifier's check only required that this accumulator is satisfiable. Well, if we remember the what the constraint system actually does, it folds into this accumulator the prior accumulator and the prior instance. So since this instance here, was actually um, represents the correct satisfaction of this prior constraint system. We actually did like you know execute this constraint system, and here this is just some you know defaultly satisfiable accumulators. So it's just some trivial element. Since we folded two green or two satisfying instances, this accumulator is also just uh, satisfiable. And so if we look at all the checks, so I've just pasted the rightmost side here. Is this a strict instance? Yes. 
do both pairs satisfy RNCS? Yes, yes, by construction. And then does this hash end up being the hash of the claim and the accumulator? Yep, we engineered it, so it was just so. And so all these checks uh, end up passing. And so now we just need to generate the malicious pair uh, for the other half of the proof and just paste them together. And that uh, ends up create, uh, creating a false proof that the vulnerable verifier actually accepted. And so we actually uh, provide a generic implementation of the attack. And just to reiterate, we uh, generated a fake proof of two of the 75 iterations of the min root VDF, uh, which in, in 116 milliseconds, which would be impossible if the if the scheme was actually secure. So in conclusion, the moral of the story is to always make sure that you have a proof of security of what you implement, or at least there exists some proof of security of what you implement. And there's now an efficient compiler from folding schemes uh, to IVC over a cycle of curves. Cool. And uh, I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Wilson. This is this was really, really cool. Um, I guess I would start and break the ice a little bit. Um, so how do you came up with that? Like what what was the like is that you looked at the paper or the implementation and like somehow you saw it directly? Did you were you running like some kind of analysis over it and then it's how you catch the thing? Like how, how this popped up? So I actually um wanted to write an SOK. Um, which is like a basically a summary of all the folding schemes out there. Um, but there was one thing that was missing. And so I was reading the Nova paper and I was like, okay, this, this works out, you know, pros are all these works. But the one thing that was missing was an actual complete description of how um, Nova was implemented over a cycle of curves. So the original paper did provide a table of the number of constraints on each curve, but didn't really... Um, describe the operation of the of the prover at all. And so I was like, okay, I don't I don't know what's happening. Uh, and so I read Justin Thaler's textbook because he wrote a section on this. Um, but it turns out that his discussion of the cycle of curves was only a footnote. But the footnote was like half uh, it was like a half a page. Um, but it didn't really provide an intuition on or okay, maybe it does for some people, but I, reading that I couldn't really tell what was going on. And so I was like, okay, you know what I have to just do the grant work. And so I just went through the code base and just reverse engineered every step until I was trying to figure out what was happening. And then I was like, okay, there's no way this works. Like, uh, like there's no constraints on X0. And so I was just like trying to think of like, you know, why, you know, I was trying to do the extraction proof, like the security proof. And I was like, there's no way this works out. Uh, and so I was like, okay, you know what? I'll just try to put junk values in X0, right? And so then I just, you know, just coded up something really quick. You know, I, of course, my uh, initial code was a little messy, uh, but then it just verified. I was like, no, there's no, there's no way. Like maybe I like ran an old version of the file or something like that. And so then I just kept on running it and I was like, oh, okay. So it actually, it actually does work. And so then I reached out to Srinath and then we were discussing about like, you know, what are potential patches? And so we settled on the fact that um, you could just remove the instance since it wasn't actually necessary. But that came after some discussion of like, how do you actually um, prove a successful extraction? And so this clean diagram sort of uh, only came up like a little bit later. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, we have some questions in the chat, if you want to read them. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll try to answer them uh, in terms of uh, uh, ease first and then, and then, I'll, then I'll go to the little longer questions. Uh, can you share a link to the slides? So it's actually a keynote uh, presentation. So I'll I'll figure out I'll coordinate with Carlos how to how to share the the slides. Um, maybe I have to upload them to Google Slides or something. Um, what was the name of the textbook you mentioned? So Justin Thaler uh, has a textbook. I think it's called Proofs, Arguments, and Zero Knowledge. So it's Justin Thaler. I'll just type that in, in the chat. So if you search him up, it will show on his webpage. Uh, is there an ongoing effort for implementing an IVC to cycle fold compiler? Uh, I think you mean, sorry, do you mean foldings? Sorry, do you, uh, so cycle fold is uh, a different compiler 
uh, from folding schemes to IVC over a cycle of curves. Uh, I am not sure if there's, you know, uh, maybe you could speak more on this, Carlos. I'm not sure if there's people implementing it just yet, but if you are going to implement something, I guess, uh, I think cycle fold is a little bit cleaner. So this was like the, this paper is like probably the first iteration of those compilers, but I think, because if you only care about computation on one field, then cycle fold like makes sense. Um, if you want to do basically some dynamic interaction between both constraint systems, imagine you had some type of, uh, uh, what do we call it, a uh, state transition function where you actually do the state transition over both fields, then, you know, maybe there's a little bit more, uh, this, our compiler is a little bit more generic, um, but, you know, there's trade-offs, so it just depends on the use case. Wait, did that, did that make sense, the, the, the answer? Or, you know? You can always ask follow-ups, I guess, since there's no other. There's no other it, it, made, it made the way. Um, I have another question then, uh, which is, so this yes, is- Yes, yes, yes. So, oh, sorry, uh, Srinath, sorry, Srinath had a response. Yes, yes, that, that is true. If you put the function inside of the, the, if you put the function inside of the actual uh, other constraint system, then you can actually execute the function itself, but plus, um, also defer the uh, the group operations to the secondary constraint system. And so, oh, you know, actually maybe you can handle state transitions too. Uh, if you put the state input into the, the secondary constraint system, but then if you do that, I think you have to make the secondary constraint system do hashing to make sure that you've compressed the state. But uh, I think cycle fold is just, uh, just better. So people should just aim for cycle fold. I don't think there's gonna be real, um, other use cases for for this original compiler. So I have another question, which is um, so Bingy in the previous uh, learning chair uh, said that uh, your compiler was basically one that we can plug in 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 Protostar and everything should work uh, fine. So in Hypernova, would this also would, would this be, be also a compiler that we can use for Hypernova, although we are folding into one instances? Like, does it make any difference at all, or it doesn't? Because we make it inside Ooh, the okay, okay. folding so, of itself. So, yeah, if you if you want to fold uh, multiple, so if you want to do a tree style folding, I think cycle fold is a little bit easier to reason about the logic. Um, but if you wanted to use this style of compiler, you basically have to alternate levels in the tree being different um, different curves. It's like every level has like two levels basically, but that becomes a pretty uh, pretty intricate. And so I think cycle flow is probably a little bit more. I think they mentioned also in the paper that it's a little, it's more appropriate for that. Um, yeah. So Binny asked if the how do you compare the efficiency of this paper compiler to cycle fold? So uh, so what is the total computation? So the primary instance in cycle fold has to fold, um, has to do a scalar, a native scalar multiplication, but then also fold instances on the opposite curve. Uh, but also it has to do its own hash constraints. And so what we, so, so what cycle fold ends up doing is they actually remove the need uh, for non-native arithmetic for the primary curve. But you, so you have like one, but you still need non-native arithmetic to fold um, the secondary instances. So it's like, one non-native arithmetic, and then uh, uh, one native scalar. So yeah, sorry, one non-native arithmetic, and then one uh, group operation. But sorry, two group operations, but both over their native constraint systems. And so our compile. And also, there needs to be a hash check. But our so, but our compiler, we do two hash checks uh, for the input and output instances, and then we also do two non-native uh, arithmetics. And also, uh, but two group operations over uh, the native field, and so cycle fold is cheaper in the sense that you don't have to do you don't have to do one non-native arithmetic, but also you don't have to do the hashing, one 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 of the hash checks. Uh, but the trade-off, or I guess the the point is to cycle fold like maximizes the amount of work on one uh, over one constraint system and minimizes the work over the secondary constraint system. I see. Thanks. So is that means it's strictly better in any cases or not? Like because I saw that there's there's some trade off in cycle curve in, in uh when you want to 
because you basically you want to add some folding operations of on Nova inside the inside the inside the circuit, right? Uh, because yeah. So what you so the trade off is that um your primary instance is bigger. Wait, sorry, actually, sorry, no, no, no it's not. Sorry, sorry, let me rephrase that. So it's not. Sorry, sorry, my bad. The primary instance is not bigger because uh, in our compiler we had to fold the opposite instance anyway, so that was already present. Right. I guess the from my understanding, like CycleCorp removes all the non-native uh, scale operations in the original uh, folding uh, verifier, but it also adds another folding verifier for Nova in order to fold all those uh, group operations, right? Yes, so, so you need to do yeah, so you do need to do non-native arithmetic for the Nova uh, for the Nova folding folding in that that's involves some group operation as well, right? One one group operations. Nova. Oh, sorry. Uh, Srinath added some clarifications. So maybe this will help here. Uh, to add a bit more, cycle fold is strictly better for folding schemes that have more finite field uh, hash operations. Yeah. So okay. Yep. And then for no. So just to reiterate uh, for the recording, because you know maybe the chat's not recorded. Uh, Srinath said. To add a bit more, cycle fold is strictly better for folding schemes that have more finite field operations and hash operations, you know, such as hypernova, protostar, or proto galaxy. For Nova, it moves the gates from the second curve to the first uh, to the first curve. It's... Yeah. So I see. Yeah. So I I think in terms of simplicity, uh and uh, concrete efficiency, if you if you only care about like, you know, actually just doing an execution of a function on, on one field, I think cycle curve is, uh, cycle fold is, is definitely the probably the better approach. Also, because it's a little easier than to reason about um, the tree folding. Also the decider leaves you with only one proof to to perform, right? Like you just need to make one snark at the end, not two. Uh, no, uh, sorry, uh, you have to check that the folded instances um in in the sorry so this because there's, there's there's still two instances you need to check oh but i right? thought because you you i thought since it's within the folding step that you include that like, like a la hypernova basically for which so, so, you do some check here it was the same yeah so, so, that, so yeah, well. yeah so the the output of this of that constraint system will be um will have an accumulator and so even though you fold these accumulators, you still have to check that the accumulator is satisfiable. So that's yeah, so that, that's the, that's yeah, enough. exactly, yeah. Yeah. I do also have another question, uh, which is more like on your vision uh, on split accumulation versus folding. For me, one thing that is clear is that we have a logarithmic cost of aggregation in split accumulation, whereas we have a constant cost for folding. And the size of the things is constant in both places. Folding is also parallelizable while split accumulation is not, since the randomness that you need in order to fold, in order to, sorry, in order to aggregate into the folded instance, you need to coordinate the randomness. So you get a randomness for the IBC, you do whatever operations you want to do, you put that it on the top of the ABC, and then the new randomness is what someone else takes to build on the top again. Whereas in folding, this doesn't matter. Like you can you can fold into one whatever you want. It's just it might be more expensive or not or whatever. Is there any use case on which it makes more sense to actually use a split accumulation rather than folding in like in your perspective? Sorry, I, I might be a little bit confused because um uh, fold, My explanation uh, so, is probably so, really bad. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. To, 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 to me, uh, folding and split accumulation are just the same names for the same things. But you could also be referring to the original, original split accumulation. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So, so hey, hey, Halo 2 style, basically. Oh, oh, Halo 2. So I guess, sorry. Uh, so the Halo 2 stuff, they call it... Um, there's uh, sorry. There's the formalization of that is called accumulation, not split. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. My bad. Uh, uh, so I I don't I don't know how much I can uh, uh comment on that. So I don't know the uh, the the OG uh, accumulation schemes, but I believe you just accumulate just all the you just batch all the pairing checks at the end, right? Is that the 
Is that the idea or? So yeah, you do, like you do logarithmic work to aggregate and at the end you do linear work in case you're using IPA, for example. And this is what the, like the original Halo 2 does in my understanding at the very least. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I uh, can Fair really comment on that. <laughs> Are there any other questions that we have? Uh, maybe in the chat or if someone wants to speak. Yeah, if anyone, yeah, if anyone wants to. Also, if, if you want, if you want to talk about uh, Cyclefold as well, you know, this would also be a perfect opportunity. Um, but yeah, no pressure as well. I'll leave thirty seconds for anyone to write or speak, and otherwise we will. Either let's read a talk or conclude the, the presentation, whatever you prefer. Oh, uh, benchmarks. Uh, so uh, you can actually run the, so the Srinath implements the fix. And so the fix is in the original Nova, um, it's in the original Nova code base. And so if you search up uh, Nova Microsoft GitHub, you can just run it yourself. But also make sure to compile it in, um, uh, add the release option because uh, the original um, the original run of this paper I said one point four six seconds to generate the fake proof, but Trina will point out that I ran it in debug mode, not a uh, not release mode. So so now it's one hundred sixteen milliseconds. <laughs> uh, I'm curious, what were major differences in between the performance before and after the patch was applied? Yeah. So if you so uh, one is we remember how the the vulnerable proof had that extra pair. So now the extra pair is not there. Um, but the difference is that uh, it depends on if you're checking the compressed proof or or the non-compressed proof, right? So the difference for the compressed proof is like negligible. Um, but then you cannot, um, you basically can't continue the IVC without doing recursive snarks. But if you check the recursive snark by itself then we've removed uh, one one of those pairs. So it's like you cut it by one fourth. And so it turns out that you can actually then, because there was like a strict instance on the secondary and a strict in, a strict accumulator, sorry, a strict instance on the secondary and an accumulator on the secondary, you can actually fold those two together. And so then you end up only with um, two pairs instead of four pairs. And this comes at the cost of an extra scalar multiplication, right? So you try you trade off memory by um, like CPU time basically. Uh no. So the uh you can actually fold those um two instances without like not in a constraint system. You just provide um yeah yeah. You just fold them. You just uh, you give them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we don't have any more questions. So thank you very much for your talk, Wilson. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for having me. And nice work. Shout out to you soon, everyone. And thanks for being in the session. Cheers. Hey, John.